Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran New York jazz trumpeter Glenn Drews. We caught up with him on April 1st, 2021 to talk about his life and music. Over his storied and rich career, he was a member of the Sesame Street House Band for several seasons. He played with the big band leaders Lionel Hampton and Woody Herman in the 70s and Buddy Rich and Dizzy Gillespie in the 80s. And since 1985, he has been a member of the great Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. He's got great stories. Enjoy. Hey, Glenn. <laughs> How you doing? Hey, Joe Domino Neon Jazz. What's up, man? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I just had to turn the sound down. I got the Yankee game on. Oh, good for you. Yeah, we're all in blue out here in Kansas City. We're all ready to roll. There you go, babe. <laughs> so you're from, you're from Babylon? Listen, this is the funny thing. I talked to Rob. We get to the end of the conversation. He mentioned Long Island. My dad grew up in Massapequa. Um, in fact, his sister was married to the Severolis, and they had a pastry shop for years up there. That's, I don't know how it all works out, Babylon, Massapequa, but he was up there in that area up there. Well, one of my, uh, one of my in high school, who I, I, uh, I studied piano as well. Um, and I actually got accepted to Eastman, not on trumpet, but on piano. Um, anyway, one of my teachers was a, also a working musician, but he lived in Massapequa. Okay. And, uh, my dad would take me to his house on Friday nights and Saturday nights, and we'd go to this little club off the expressway in Queens, and uh, they'd let me sit in as a second trumpet player. They had a band. You know, yeah. I mean, every, every place had a band. And I learned how to mark parts, and I learned how to, you know, play for acts. And I was just a kid, man. I was like 17, you know. It was, it was crazy, but yeah. Yeah. That's Pequa. It's, it's very cool. Yeah, you know, it's funny. My dad passed the, at 64, which now that I'm getting older, it is young. I remember when it happened. Everybody was like, God, he's so young. But he... Yeah, way too yeah, young. Way too young. So he uh, he was born in Brooklyn, raised in uh, Massapequa, and joined the military. He was so hot to try to get to see the world that he got stationed in Kansas City, fell in love. And boom, here we are. And I get people all the time that are like, how the hell did a Domino end up in Kansas City? <laughs> and then I, I tell them the story about my dad. But, you know, it's funny. I really miss my dad. And he never knew about this radio show. And I've been doing it since 2011 now. And I think he would really dig it. But it's funny how that, like, that, that energy and spark that was a part of him I'm, I'm getting it recreated because all these cats are from that area up there. I mean, I'm talking to people, the younger ilk, for sure, from Brooklyn, and then a lot of the old guard, and just a lot of people that have history from that area up there. And it's very, very interesting to kind of travel to that. And I touch base with a lot of Italian musicians. I contribute to an online portal all about jazz, and one of the guys there has a direct connection to Italian artists. So there's this kind of cyclical thing that goes through that, uh, that works out pretty well. Oh, wow. You know, all right, so so I was born in Brooklyn. Of course, my family, you know, and after the war, they all moved out from Brooklyn and came out to Long Island, which was mainly potato farms and like that, you know, back then, you know. So, so isn't that bizarre? But uh, did, yeah. now, did your dad play? No, no. He he was a car salesman. Uh, he didn't do anything artistic. Um, no one in my family did. The fact that I'm doing what I'm doing... Um, I've always kind of been a black sheep. I was the first one that graduated from college, and I actually got into journalism. My original intent was sports journalism, but once I got on the inside, that was back in the 90s when David Cohn came up here. I was like, I don't know if I can hang with these guys and do this as a career and kind of bowed out of sports. And then just in 2011, I grabbed a show called The Neon Beat. It was kind of the American songbook and uh, the Rat Pack and all those guys, and I reached out to the guy that was doing it, and he just happened to live four blocks away. He had old radio equipment. He was a day engineer for a major uh, radio station. He said, write a script, come over. I wrote jazz, and it's been that way ever since. Wow, very cool story, man. That's great. I'm not sure. Are you a player as well? I play drums, but I try to stay away. I, I like to be an admirer for all the things that I've decided to dive into. I think I want to be one of those guys that stands back and just takes in that that audio sensation of, of music without understanding it as much as being on the inside. 
Well, we we definitely need guys like you to keep this thing going, you know, for sure. Name is you know the, the Drew's name is Germans, but uh, the other part was from Trieste, my mother's family. Uh, okay. So we got that thing happening. But um, do you know who Lou Marini is? Sounds familiar. Sounds very uh, familiar. Well, he was in the Blues Brothers movie Blue Lou, uh, the yeah. sax player. Yeah, you know who he is. Yeah. Everybody and uh-huh. he travels with James Taylor now. You know, but. He's a New yeah. York guy, and I used to go over to, to Italy with him every year in this town. It's up on the Adriatic Sea, pretty far north, called Rimini. And yeah. uh, there were a bunch of musicians that all went to college together. And when they were in college, they had like a Blues Brothers band. So they would bring the New York guys over, and the two guys, the singers, would sing with us. And it, So we went over and spent a lot of time in Italy. And, oh, uh, yeah. You go out with those guys. You go to the. You don't go to a tour spot. You go to the hippest places. You know. Yeah, yeah. I love Italy, man. I mean, it was. I was actually just talking to my friend John Christopher last night, who, who engineered my show, and I was talking about this connection to Italian musicians, and I'd been over there, and there's just such a good feeling that the the people and the customs and the history. You just walk into certain places, and you just feel good about it. And Italy has always felt good to me. Oh, it's great. I. I, I remember we, we, we did a, I was with the Vanguard uh, band for 23 years, um, and we did a trip to Italy at one point, and somehow we got there late, the plane was delayed, and the, the bus broke down, and we were going to this little town and a festival way up in the mountains, and uh, there were three different places they were going to put us up, and we got to this place, and it was probably 11 o'clock at night, and the little old, <laughs> little old Italian lady came out. What do you want to eat? We go, well, it's, you know, nothing, not now. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow. She goes, oh, no, you come here, you eat. And they put out a meal. It was incredible. I mean, it just kept coming. You know, I had to loosen my belt three times. It's like three or four courses. It's this amazing, immaculate, it's like an event. You know, it's a beautiful so, thing. They love their wine. Yeah. They love their food. It's it's great. It really is terrific. You know, the first time I went over there, I there I had a pen pal in high school, and she was in a little town called Castel Ferentio, which is south of, of Florence. And I remember when I got there, they owned a restaurant. I'm just eating my spaghetti, doing my thing, and I didn't realize till later, her dad was sitting there just staring at me, and he couldn't take it anymore. He put his silver in and said, "God damn it!" He got up. He said it in Italian. He got up and he grabbed my hand and he said, "Watch me," you know. <laughs> And and he just showed me how to spin that pasta on that spoon, but he couldn't watch my American hands fumble anymore. He was like, I can't take this guy. So <laughs> oh, that's he came over, yeah, and he straightened me out, and I've always done that ever since. I've always thought about it, and he was telling me that, too. He said, think about what you're doing. Stop being in a hurry. Watch what you're doing and, and maximize what you're doing, and it's good. I've always oh, remembered that. Oh, that's so. terrific. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's great. yeah. What a great story. So, yeah, it's it's good. But it's funny you mentioned the Vanguard. That's how I closed my show last night, 694. I closed out. I mentioned Mel Lewis and Thad Jones and how in 66 it was a Monday night and 2,700 plus later, here you go. And I specifically said that story last night on the show. It was incredible. How I got there, Mel had a, just a quick story, it had like a little run-in with one of the guys. The guy wasn't in a good frame of mind at the time and Mel said, all right, that's it. Yeah, I think you should take a break or something, you know. So I lived, uh, I had a loft with Joe Lovano. Uh, I was there, and I got the call from Earl Gardner. He said, listen, can you make the third set? <laughs> they used to do three sets back then. Yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. You know, so it, it, I guess it went okay, you know. And at the end of the night, uh, Earl says to me, they called him Bird, because when he, was, when he first joined, he was, very big, and they wore dashikis. He had a yellow dashiki, so Thad called him Big Bird. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, Bird, he says, listen, can you make it next week? I go, yeah, sure. And that turned into 23 years. So Wow. That's wonderful, man. I turned around, and I did... Uh, I mean, we close. We used to play softball together and, uh, and all this stuff. Uh, I, I'm the lead trumpet at the show Chicago on Broadway, and uh, there was an opening. There was the, the guy that was playing second left. He retired, and I, I got Earl Bird 
on the gig, so I'm back with him, standing next to him every night when we go back to work. Man, that's great. That's good stuff for sure. And I really did want to – oh, one thing I did want to say, I did actually talk to Joe Lovano a couple weeks ago, and I am just always struck – I've talked to him twice – how cool he is, how wise he is, and how comfortable he is with just everything. Like the last conversation we had about, you know, the pandemic and everything that was going on, just how in control of his voice and world that he is. It's amazing. I'll tell you what, you know, and so we had this loft together in New York for, I don't know, 10 years, 11 years, whatever it was. And I'm telling you, this guy, you could put him with a big band. You could put him with a... uh, you know, quintet, you could put him with a, just a duo, a trio, and then you can put him by himself. And it doesn't make any difference. And he could be playing at the Vanguard. He could be playing outside at a, you know, at, at a wedding. He could be playing at uh, a bowling alley. <laughs> and he he grooves on every situation and makes it the best it can be. Yeah. He's totally, yeah. I mean, and he fits in every place. So we had this loft. I get a call one day, and I used to do a lot of these, like, uh, they call them club dates here. I don't know what they call them out where you are, but they used to call them casuals or this and that. So, but it was weddings, uh, bar mitzvahs, this, stuff like that, you know, uh, friars, roasts, and things. So I, I, I'm, I used to work with all those guys, Peter Duchin and Lester Lannon. And uh, so I get a call from one day from this contractor. He said, Man, I got to I got to get a hold of a clarinet player. Man, it's like if for the preheat, you know. So preheat is like a clarinet and a violin and maybe a guitar player, you know, acoustic guitar strolling, right? So I did. You call so and so? Yeah, he can't do it. Did you call so and so? No, he can't do it. Did you call? And so Lovano's sitting on the couch. He goes, "What's going on?" I said, "Ah, they, this guy needs a clarinet player to do that." And you're playing all like, you know, the French things, and you know, da 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 da, you know, all stuff. <laughs> he goes, yeah. "I'll do it. I'll go." So I go, "All right, I got a guy for you. He's going to do it." So the guy says, "Great. Tell him be at the plaza seven o'clock, and I'm going to be at the plaza late when the big band when the band starts at, at eight. I hang up. I go, "What did I just do? I'm sending Lovano." to play clarinet on this gig. They're doing, they call it like continental music. Yeah. I go, this is the last time I'm going to work for this guy. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm fretting the whole day. I'm going, yeah. oh, my God. Oh, my God. I said, what did I do? I must be crazy. So anyway, <laughs> I get to the gig, and the contractor comes up to me. He goes, where did you get that guy? I go, I'm, I, I'm so, he's my roommate. I'm, I, I'm getting ready to say I'm sorry. He goes, this guy is fabulous. He knows it all. <laughs> he was great. Why don't we use this guy? <laughs> and I told the father, he goes, no, nah, once is enough. I proved I could do it. That's it. <laughs> but that's Joe. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a true story. It's good, man. You know, so. Yeah, that's wonderful, man. Well, how did all of the music begin for you? How did you get involved with music? Uh, how did I get involved with music? That's a good question. So, I'm eight years old. All I wanted to do was be out in the yard playing or in the street playing ball with the kids. And my dad says, come on, we're going for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm eight years old. You got This is like Leave it to Beaver stuff, you know. So I go, uh, where are we going? He goes, I'm going to get you piano lessons because my dad played, you know, a little bit. You know, he, he wasn't a professional, but he played, you know. He says, I'm going to get you piano. I go, I don't want piano lessons. <laughs> He goes, listen, you'll thank me when you're older and you're at a party, you play, and all the girls will sit on the bench. I'm eight years old. I hate girls. I right. go, I don't want to. You know, so anyway, <laughs> I, took, I took piano. Then uh, at, at 12, I was in the sixth grade, I guess, they came around with the instruments and they showed the violin and the flute and the clarinet and the sax and the trombone. And the last one was the trumpet. He pulled it out and I, I just said, that's what I want to do. You know, and uh, yeah. I was lucky because the head of the music department, who was not a jazz guy, he was a legit guy. His name was Ed Diulio. Jazz was still forbidden most in most of the schools. 
and you couldn't get arrangements and, and this and that. And he, he finally, he saw the light and knew that this was going to be the next thing. And he hired all the guys he hired to teach, the elementary teachers and the junior high teachers and this and that, were guys that were working musicians at night, like that guy I told you about, the piano, my piano teacher. And Barry Titone was a saxophone player. And w Willie Wayman was a, was a trumpet player, bass player. But they all worked all the time. And they taught us. And they, with that in mind, when we graduated high school, Barry Titone, who's the guy that started my brother um, in elementary school on clarinet. So he, he had an in with Lionel Hampton. His brother was Hamp's manager. So when we came of age, like after college, he would get us with Hamp. And that's how it started. And then we just started working, you know, and just don't screw up and you'll keep working. Well, you know, obviously things worked out. You were around Lionel Hampton, Woody Herman, Buddy Rich, Dizzy Gillespie. What did you learn from those guys? You know, I mean, it's, it's a big question, but I guess more or less, you know, a lot of these guys will lay down fundamentals for the way that you live your life as a musician. What did they do for you? I mean, we all know about them, obviously, but they really do, may, whether it's conscious or unconscious, they teach younger players around them, around them quite a bit. What did they teach you? A great question. A great question. What all of them have in common, I think, is getting the best out of their players. And think about this. Whether you're with Buddy Rich, whether you're with Dizzy, whether you're with Woody's band, or Hamp, whatever, any of those guys. They have to, if you, you know, if you were a, like, a, a, like a Sinatra singer or, you know, you, these people, want, well, even James Taylor, these people want to hear the hits every night, right? They want to hear the hits. They want to hear the things that, that they know that you're famous for. What is it, what is it that, they, that you, by playing with these guys and, and playing with great guys around you in the band, in the orchestra, you know, in the group, and you're going to play the same solo, you know, whether it's Woodchopper's Ball or Caledonia or something, you play that thing every night. And these guys don't want to hear the same thing every night. And you don't want to play the same thing every night. So it, 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 you develop and you keep practicing, getting better. And I know for me the biggest thing was the consistency thing. Was you're going to have, look, you're going to have great nights. And you're going to have some nights when the horn is, like a bitch, you know. But the whole thing is to make that consistency level go up and and stay up, you know. So I think, you know, and those guys were doing it for 50 years when he was out there, you know, all those guys, dizzy. You know how many times he played a night in Tunisia? <laughs> what, it, what Joe DiMaggio used to say, you know, they used to say, why do you play so hard? Because there's somebody out there that hasn't seen me play. And that's the same thing with... Uh, with Broadway, you know, it's, you're doing the same thing. I've been doing Chicago 13 years. Same thing every night. But sometimes there's somebody coming to the show the first time, and you don't want to stink, and you don't want to stink for your, you don't want to stink for yourself, and you don't want to stink for your fellow musicians or the actors. So I think I learned consistency from those guys. You know, there's so many things that you've done over your career. So many outfits you've been a part of. We talked about Vanguard. What are you the proudest of? When you really think about what you've done in your career, what makes you the happiest? Uh, what makes me the happiest? Probably longevity. Just being able to do it and keep doing it better and better. And uh, Probably one of my favorite gigs was, was the almost 20 years I did doing Sesame Street. And that was uh, incredible because you didn't know what you were going to have to do. Sometimes it would be, uh, you know, like a little a jingle thing, you know, Elmo's theme. Or it could be you had a classical singer on and you had to do that. I, I'm going to give you, I don't know if you can hear this, but I, one time I get in there and they say we were doing something to a cartoon and they needed a sound like a goose, right? A goose. Yeah, sure. And what the heck do you do for that? <laughs> you can't give it to a guitar player or a bass player or a clarinet. So I pulled out my tuning slide, 
uh, I'll just do this for you to demonstrate. <laughs> but this is my goose. <laughs> Pretty good, I hear right? it. Not I hear bad. it. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not bad. But, you know, it was like that. You had to kind of reinvent yourself. And, uh, but I think the longevity and the thing it was, I think it most I'm proudest of, um, the thing I'm most proud of, I should say, is I think not only leaders, but guys on the band and section mates enjoy having me there because I never come with an attitude. You know, if the guy says you're playing first, you play first. If you're playing second, you play second. It, it makes no difference to me, and there's no ego involved. And I think that's probably what I'm most proud of, longevity and the thing that people like having me there. And going along that line, you know, we've been we've gone through a hell of a last year. Um, you know, there's been no live music. There's been a lot of things that have been turned upside down for everybody. What are you looking forward to the most when we kind of start returning to life? What do you want to do? How are you wanting to what, – what do you want to pick back up that you lost from last year? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot there. Yeah. I know last summer, because I do a lot of, of saltwater surf casting and kayak fishing, and I met these guys, and turned out one guy was a piano player that studied with Barry Harris. Another guy was a guitar player that, uh, in his early days, he played on Broadway, and he, he had a little band. Another guy is a bass player. And so I had a session at my house one, one afternoon, you know, and we all distanced and all that, and we played. And the neighbors came by or, or clapped, you know, and, and I'm, I live in a neighborhood where you don't really see your neighbors too much. Um, but to get back to the routine, you know, of playing every day, playing with people, and, you know, um, like Broadway does eight shows a week. So I would say I averaged probably shows a week because I was doing other stuff and just being you know it's like being on a football team or a baseball team you know the camaraderie you have with the guys to tell you the truth I'm, I don't know New York City is pretty crime ridden these days so I'm not really looking forward to getting on a subway every day but you know I, you know, I, I, I want to get back and do what I love to do you know, and I'm not ready to say it's over, but if we go through another year of this, I don't know. I don't know how Broadway is going to open up with less than a hundred percent. I yeah. don't think they can. I don't think they can financially do it, and uh, and I don't know when they're going to be able to do that. You know, because it's based on tourism, whether it's American oh, yeah. tourists or foreign tourists. So, yeah, I, I don't yep, know. Uh, I you know I want to get back in. Look, uh, the good thing about this, I have three sons. My mother-in-law lives here. Of course, my wife is a nurse, so she's been working through all this. But we've had some really good family things, which I've never had. And one day, in the middle of this, I looked at my horn. I was practicing. I looked at my horn, and my wife walked in. I said, do you know that I've spent more alone time with this hunk of metal than I have with you? Yeah. Because, you know, she'd get home at, six o'clock, I'd leave at five thirty. You know, and yeah. get home and then, you know, it's like the end of the day. So but so, you know, I think what everybody is some normalcy. Yeah. Uh yeah. you know uh, I've been lucky because the fishing thing hasn't been affected. Um in the summer I do a lot of cycling and uh I've been playing a lot of golf with one of my sons lately, so you know, it's been good like that. I can't do this forever, you know, to sit here and just practice. <laughs> yeah. So. so everything's going to come down to this. Everyone has a perception or their version of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Yeah. Oh, I, well, I think I'm one of the luckiest guys <laughs> ever, not to quote Lou Gehrig, but yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think I'm pretty lucky. Everything is, uh, I, I, didn't make a mistake, uh, uh, you know, I married the right gal. My sons are, you know, pretty healthy and doing their thing. They're all different. I mean, the work thing has just been, I, you know, I keep going. I, you know, I look back and 
who I've worked with. Not that I want to look back, but, I, you know, thinking about this interview, and, and you start to think about the stuff you've done, and I'm just the luckiest uh, guy. You know, but, you know, it, I guess it's luck, but you have to be prepared going in. And, uh, like, I'm not a great lead player, and I'm not a great jazz player. I'm certainly not a great legit player, but I do all things pretty good. You know, baseball, they would call me the ultimate utility player, I think. So I, that's what I am. I'm a utility player that knows how to get the job done. Beautiful. And we all need that, man. Hey, thank you for taking some time out. It's been a joy to talk to you and to catch up and, and learn about your life in jazz, man. It's been a great one. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Glenn for his class, cool, and time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.